Thank you, Dr. Ehler. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Dr. Ehler mentioned, I'm Aliyah Baluch. I work at Moffitt Cancer Center. I'm one of the dedicated transplant ID physicians. If you have any questions, um, use the little raise hand icon or um, there should be a chat um, or we can just go over all the questions at the end, either or. I'm good with either. Uh, as always, whenever I talk, I talk under the umbrella of the antimicrobial stewardship program of which I'm the um, assistant director. Thank you. So what we're going to go over is, um, and especially because it's been a little bit of time since I've given a presentation um, to the fellows, we're going to review some of my favorite elements in reference to transplant ID like the net state of immunosuppression. We're gonna talk about how we choose our transplants, what we do during vital organ testing over three days, and some of the discussion points about high-risk donors as defined by DTAC, CMV background, which is what the majority of this presentation is about, um, but in the context of when do these infections occur in transplant. We'll then talk about briefly the workup of CMV. Obviously, this is individualized per the patient, per the institution. Then we're going to talk about general therapies. Some of it is the ideas behind therapies and then the different types of mechanisms or algorithms we do, as well as the drugs. So the next state of immunosuppression is a very important concept because usually, you know, we just are like, well, here's the bug, let's pick my drugs, pick my duration and sign off of the case. But unfortunately in transplant or fortunately because this is part of what I enjoy the most is that when you look at the patient, you have to think of like kind of the competition between all the immunosuppression that they're trying to give to the patient to maintain their graft, whether it is a bone marrow graft or in organ, whether it be steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, mTORs, all the other variety of drugs. And then you have then the flip side of this is that the more immunosuppression, also then the more infections, whether it's a bacterial infection, fungal, viral, or even TB reactivation, which unfortunately we've seen, as well as secondary cancer risk. And this is a very important thing. You can't quantify it, but you can definitely think about it actively when you're assessing a patient. It just goes to show not all patients are the same, even when they walk in the door to get ready for transplant. When someone needs a transplant, especially looking from the perspective of a stem cell transplant, you know, there are certain diseases that meet requirements, for example, high risk MDS or high risk acute myelogenous leukemia. We need a transplant. They'll be assessed by the bone marrow transplant team and they'll look at well, what kind of donors do they have available. We ideally, for multiple reasons, decrease risk of infection, decrease risk of GVHD, also known as graft versus host disease. We'll look at closer relatives like match related donor. If nowadays with the newer data, we then the next option would become a haploidentical, and especially this is where a lot of the new research is being done. So it's still a first degree relative, but instead of being a full match, by HLA, it's a half match, and therefore there are adjustments in the chemotherapy regimen and the GVHD regimen, often utilizing what we would call post-transplant cyclophosphamide. If there are no family members, maybe the person has no parents, not married, and has no children, that then will look at registries, either U.S. registries or non-U.S. registries, there is something to note that if you get stem cells, for example, from Japan, they do not believe in peripheral blood um, donor, so, which is what we do mainly here in the U.S. But so all the donors that get stem cells from Japan, it's actually literally bone marrow. So there can be spicules of bone. It's a lot more kind of 
work intensive when we go to put it into the patient. Um, it also unfortunately takes longer to engraft utilizing bone marrow. Um, on the flip, there are also certain indications from a disease perspective that we use bone marrow, and that's usually in aplastic anemia is the number one that comes to mind. But as you can see in the graphic, if you don't have any family members, you don't have any adults in a registry, then that's the consideration for cord registry. Previously, we used to do double cords. There are some centers that still do double cords or they will consider a single cord. But as I originally mentioned, kind of the upswing is the haploidentical and the downswing is anything to do with cords because they take so long to engraft. They have a high rate of failure and a high rate of infection because it takes too long to engraft. Moving forward, so like we, the BMT team or the primary team looks at the patient, they're like, okay, do you have a donor source? And also, are you well enough to actually survive transplant? So over three days, they get what's called vital organ testing, and they get a slew of serology, seeing if you've been exposed to over your lifetime to a wide variety of infections, CMV being one of them. So there's a lot of the latent viruses of herpes, so CMV, EBV, HSV, VZV being chickenpox, toxoplasma. So people will often say, well, I don't own any cats, so I don't know why I'm toxopositive. I'm like, yeah, but you said you came from this part of the U.S. or Puerto Rico, and you lived on a farm that had cats, feral cats. So unfortunately, once you get exposed as a child or as a youth, that exposure stays with you, and then it becomes an infectious risk. Other infections, as you can see, we test for syphilis, HIV, HTLV, hepatitis B and C. There's also ferritin looking for, example, iron overload, increased risk for invasive mold infection. Um, usually at Moffitt, we utilize this kind of like a benchmark of less than or more than 2,000 ferritin um, for iron overload. Non-labs that are also done as a requirement are pulmonary function tests because, for example, if your lung quality is so poor that you're already on oxygen and you have huge blebs, then the concern is that you could die in transplant and then we're not improving your life, we're just detracting and that would not be appropriate. We also do baseline imaging with a CT sinus without contrast, CT chest without contrast. And like I, when I give part of this lecture to the general medicine residents, I always ask them like, why are these CTs without contrast? Just to remind people, contrasted CTs are for looking at lymphadenopathy. We're not looking at lymphadenopathy, we're looking at the air spaces and the sinuses, looking for invasive fungal disease, looking for bone destruction, which would be really bad. And even on the lungs, we're again looking at lung tissue. So we're looking for halo signs, reverse halo signs. Ideally, as a benchmark, we tend to want lung nodules to be improving less than 1.5 centimeters. And ideally, with a diagnosis, um, we were just discussing a separate case via email in a high-risk individual that we don't have a diagnosis, but the lung nodule is improving on anti-mold therapy. And as I mentioned, like the most important thing is the patient's infection is improving, thus it's still okay to move forward with transplant. We do an EKG at baseline because especially from an ID perspective, we're looking at the QTC corrected to ensure, can we use our appropriate prophylaxis or treatment medications, echoes, because like I fondly say, not all shortness of breath is from pneumonia. We do like to make sure the EF is adequate. And then bone marrow biopsy, that's to remind people that our patients have to be in remission traditionally for most of the diseases to go forward with transplant. A few words about increased risk donors. Um, and you know, where I trained previously, we had an open discussion about this. Nowadays, especially in bone marrow transplant, a lot of it is just simply you know, the increased risk related to 
the donor lives in Europe and, you know, ate meat during mad cow disease slash, you know, prion. And so that's why there's a waiver. But I did feel that it was a good spot to kind of bring this up, especially if you had never heard of this phenomenon. So it's defined as increased risk to either a organ recipient or a bone marrow recipient usually in reference to a specific infection. So you'll see the form will say increased risk for HIV, Hep B, Hep C, or variant uh, Crutzip Jakob disease. And then as just some statistics in 2015, the increased risk donors represented 19.5% of the donor pool. This is in reference to organ transplant. Um, and then below is just the abbreviation of what DTAC stands for. DTAC works under UNOS. And then they have a very good document, which is, has some data talking about how what we were missing was the connection of you know, increased risk donors, that we had these potential organs that were just being thrown away. And so the group back in 2017 went back and said, how do we further optimize the use of these organs to people who need it? Because the point was, you know, if you're waiting for a pristine heart, you're going to die on the list. Why not get these people off the list and with like a moderate heart, moderate quality heart, and then, you know, make sure that they understand that there's a theoretical risk but mitigate that theoretical risk to as low as possible. So this is just talking about how we've been able to increase some amount of our organs despite them being increased risk. And then this was what it was all about, was that making sure that you know, the politicians and the bosses and leadership of UNOS understood that our testing had become much better. So for example, with HIV testing, with NAT testing, which is now the current standard of care, that we get the window period down to five to six days. So as a real live example, maybe your donor, your organ donor, died because of an overdose with a needle in their arm. So obviously they have risk for all of the bloodborne infections, but you could explain to the potential recipient or and or their family that your window is very narrow because of this improvement in the laboratories looking for these infections. So it's been highly um, important that we have these numbers. And if you're doing this type of job on a daily basis, you should be able to quote them to say, you know, if you're an IV drug user, this is your percentage of risk despite having negative testing. And then there were some critical changes in the guidelines from like 1994, which was the guideline that was still active when I originally went through transplant ID training compared to 2013 update. For example, kind of like loosening the stranglehold on these organs, saying if you were a man who had sex with man or men in the preceding five years, and then narrowed it down if you had an MSM in the preceding 12 months. Again, just adjusting, especially in a view of updated labs about what is considered high risk. And it's good to know so that when your teammates are using this vocabulary, what the heck they're even talking about. So moving forward again, I mainly just took out some of these snapshots as references. So you were aware of like updates, then there were things that previously had not been discussed. For example, when a deceased potential donor's medical or behavioral history wasn't available. That was never even referenced in the previous one. Now we acknowledge because you have no ability to ask, we cannot adequately risk stratify so then it would be considered then high risk. So moving on to what is the main part of this discussion is talking about CMV. So I always tell people, you know, if your team is big and your attending has gone in to see a patient with one of the team members, whoever then is outside waiting, like don't twiddle your fingers, don't look at your phone. 
Um, this is your opportunity to look like a superstar and teach. And so if someone needed teaching points on CMV, your first tier or your first layer of that onion would be these items. The CMV is a herpes virus. It's a latent virus. Once you've got it, it's with you forever. That traditionally most of the third world is seropositive, usually for the first world. If you become positive, it will be later on in life, like in daycares or things like that. The, the issue in transplants is about reactivation or replication of the virus while on immunosuppression leads to high levels of morbidity and mortality. That is why this is, you know, causes great excitement for us. That lativermir and valgancyclovir, depending on your case scenario, are your main prophylactic medications. And that for treatment, you have gangcyclovir, valgancyclovir, foscarnas, cydofovir, and maravivir are your main treatment medications. This is like your, on one hand or in two hands, data points that you should be able to rattle off. With that in mind, if you had a little bit more time because maybe somebody was talking too long with the attending, you could be like, also, I find very interesting there is no non-human vectors for the infection. And that pertinent, especially for med students that are rotating between adult and pediatrics, is to realize that CMV is unfortunately the most common of the torch organisms. And just to remind everybody, whether it's for an exam or for real life, torch is the infections that you can get while pregnant, that is toxoplasmosis, other rubella CMV and e, HSV, and other being syphilis, VZV, parvo, and HIV. So it's always good to go back and double check, you know, what <laughs> some of these mnemonics mean. I was like, uh, it's always worthwhile. But um, like I said, I always forget that actually it's the most common of the torch, but still important. I really like this graphic. I saw this originally when I was a fellow, went to my first ID board review up in DC, and I still love it because this is what draws me the transplant ID. You have the same infection being CMV, but it can present very differently depending on your host. So if you're looking at a solid organ transplant patient versus stem cell transplant patient versus HIV AIDS, and then in all honesty, CAR-T is somewhere in there, but CAR-T is so heterogeneous, it's very hard to categorize in a similar manner. But looking, say, at stem cell transplant, out of all of these, it's the one that highest rate of pneumonitis. But in all honesty, I haven't seen a pneumonitis, true pneumonitis case in the, at least three years, maybe five and um, the, I will give one caveat because I haven't written it down. Is like, how would you diagnose someone with pneumonitis? You always have, you look at your different spaces in a person. So you have the blood space and you have the organ space. So looking at pneumonitis, you would have to have, and I'm making up numbers. Say if the blood was only 300 international units of CMV, but the bronch was 3,000, then that means your primary source of infection is the lungs, and that would be deemed a true CMV pneumonitis case. But if the flip was like the lung is only 300 international units, but the blood is 3,000, then that's not pneumonitis, that's viremia, and that is your main issue. But as you can see, this is mainly for your reference to realize it's not one size fits all and to be very aware that like certain infections in the bone marrow like CMV can cause pancytopenia, can make you drop your count. So even though that can be a potential side effect profile of the drugs, you can actually see all of a sudden the counts go up because now you're treating the CMV in the bone marrow. A lot of what this presentation is kind of comparing solid organ transplant to bone marrow transplant. And so here was a little bit of the thought process of the algorithm of like what is actually happening. So in solid organ transplant, you have a CMV positive graph, then you put that in the new in the patient. And then the theory is that the CMV then can go into general circulation of a host. 
especially to see if the host is seen being negative, that's very dangerous to the host. And then that's where you have the potential for a very aggressive CMV infection because they have no immunity. This also can occur even when you have an episode of rejection, they go on ATG, they go on high dose steroids. And again, that balance can get lost and you have to be worried about a CMV um, replication period of time. With stem cell transplants, you the bigger issue traditionally was thought to be is if the recipient was already CMV positive, you're now wiping out all their memory B cells, and then you give them stem cells from a host that's never been exposed to CMV, and again, you lose that balance, and so then the own recipient, the patient CMV starts to replicate. Again, this is just kind of thought processes of what we think happens, what makes sense from a pathophys. Is it perfect? No. There are still many different scenarios. The one thing that most people will state that if you have a donor that's negative, a recipient that's negative, you should have minimal risk. But even then, they still recommend on a less frequent but still regular timeline, they say to check for CMV PCR because of the exposure from the community, they could still get a primary CMV infection. I love these next two graphics. I think they are literally the bomb because it really helps, again, show what happens when and because of what. So this is the, the what I would say the famous paper from Marcy Tomlin, now known as Marcy Riches about your timeline for infections in bone marrow transplant. And though it's not necessarily the most like newest paper, it's this doesn't change. You get your chemotherapy and you have mucositis and that leads to the issues of the day for pre-engraftment. Then phase two is after your mouth is healed but you're losing your B cells, this is now post-engraftment. And then phase three or late phase, this is now things like that are reactivating because you've lost all your um, immunity. So like I was saying, um, as you can see from the graphic, it's split bacterial, viral, fungal. So for the interest of this presentation, we're looking at this period of time. Um, we had one patient, as just an example, he reactivated CMV in the first couple of weeks. And part of it had to do with the previous therapy he had right before admission, increased the risk of for CMV reactivation, hence the reason why the kind of the graphic got a little bit off cycle. On the flip, because I wanted also to make sure that we didn't leave solid organ transplant out on the wind, here's a graphic from Ron Halloran. Um, not Ron, uh, from Jay Fishman uh, about also CMV, but from the perspective of an organ transplant, it's more of kind of like your mid time point, but still also late time points, depending on how long you utilize prophylaxis, which we'll get to in a few moments. So we went over the net state of immunosuppression, a bit about why or which types of aloes we utilize, vital organ testing in a very brief overview, high-risk donors according to DTAC slash UNOS, CMV is kind of like some of those high-level things that you could teach while in rounds, and the phases of infection according to the Tomlin and the Fishman paper. So how do you work up CMV. So most of the centers, especially for say a BMT patient, will do CMV once a week by PCR. Most places are no longer using antigen testing because it's inferior. So they do PCR and um, not multiplex, just a single test because you want the highest sensitivity and specificity possible. And the recommendations per national guidelines is up to day 100. Now, if the patient is having issues of graft versus host disease, first of all, the patient is also staying local longer, and then they will prolong that period of time that they're doing serial testing. So post-transplant, um, you assess traditionally, 
It used to be in copies per ml, but then slowly but surely, most centers have flipped over to IU per ml. But if you see someone getting local labs, you still might see copies. The problem with copies is you cannot cop compare copies at, say, TGH versus copies at Moffitt versus copies at LabCorp. These are not standardized units. Now, the theory behind international units is it becomes like INR, that you should be able to compare, um, and it should make it easier to look at papers, but you'd be surprised it's still a little bit on the difficult side. So then you have to figure out, okay, what's your cutoff for positivity? So I was just using as an example for the Moffitt SOP, we use 650. Again, can be arbitrary. You could go to a different center like MD Anderson, they'll be like, nope, we think anything positive is positive. And they might even have a different cutoff for a different type of stem cell transplant. So like a half low might be positive for 200 and it might be 500 for a match related donor. So these are things that wherever you end up working or wherever you current work, you have to look at the SOPs of the center to figure out what is their particular cutoff. And then also if you have, if you're looking for a CMV disease and not just CMV viremia, you need a biopsy. So for example, CMV of the gut, you need a scope. And then you, even if they don't see anything, they do random biopsies because that's often how we get graft versus host disease. But then if there is ulceration, then they'll biopsy the ulcer. On lungs, it's very difficult to get a lung biopsy, but in theory, they could do an EBIS or a Wang needle and get a lung biopsy. Livers, definitely we will biopsy if we're looking for CMV of the liver, leading to a, a hepatitis type of presentation. So again, biopsy is very important. And this was one of the last slides that I had added in because I was like, you know, this actually was still even on my board um, update from ID was about the whole owl's eye, which is pathognomonic or stereotypical at least for CMV invasive disease. And then with these pieces of information, then we're able to make a recommendation on how to treat. I still find a lot of people forget that if you have CMV of the gut, you really shouldn't be using oral therapy. You should be using IV therapy because if the person's having lots of diarrhea and you expose them, say, to an oral medication and it just gets pooped out because they have too fast of a throughput, then you could be exposing that virus to low levels of that drug, therefore driving then resistance issues. So that's why the recommendation is, especially until the diarrhea is resolved, to consider IV if possible. So we went through the workup as well in a very general tone. Let's talk about therapy. So this is one of my favorite graphics just because it helps. I'm a very image person and to help understand things as you go up the pyramid. It's increased cost as well as increased nephrotoxicity. So what we use a lot is acyclovir-based products like Famvir, Valley, Cyclovir. This is covering your HSV and VZV, very commonly used, for example, for a protocol for us on bone marrow transplant would be on admission, you start a Cyclovir 800 milligrams POBID, the idea being you don't have to wait for neutropenia to be at risk for a herpetic outbreak. It's a stress-induced response, so that's why we updated our protocol to start it on the day of admission. Moving up the pyramid, you have gangcyclovir-based products or valgangcyclovir. Please do not mix up valcyt and valtrex. This is why if you write the generic phrase you have a lower chance of making an error with that sound alike. So in theory, if you wanted to use a bazooka for a small problem, you could use them for HSV and VZV. More importantly, it is for CMV and second line for HHV6. If you're at a center that treats HHV6. Foscarnid is more nephrotoxic. 
And that um, compared to gang cyclear, this is also HSV, VZV, CMV, especially if you have non engrafted and you have poor counts. And first line for HHV6. Up on the top is Cydofovir based products, HSV, VZV, CMV, Adeno, and BK. There's a couple little special things wrapped in here. So, as an aside, if you have thymidine kinase issues with your HSV, meaning acyclovir resistant HSV, you go directly from an acyclovir based product, skip gang cyclovir, go to foscarinib. That is a critical piece of information because of the way of the resistance style. Cydofovir that if you're using it for adenovirus, you don't have to use what's in, quote unquote, the textbook of five mg per kg once a week or every other week. We find it very nephrotoxic. We've had very good outcomes with alternative algorithms or alternative dosing for both BK as well as adenovirus. Again, those are per hospital SOPs, but there are other ways to do dosing that are out there. What is very important, especially in the field of solid organ transplant, is this whole discussion of CMV prophylaxis versus preemptive therapy. Um, as you can see, you know, prophylaxis is very efficacious. If you take the drug, it works really well. You know every day you're going to take it. The problem is is it just delaying inevitable when you stop the prophy? Does it just start later? And it is very expensive because you're taking an additional drug once a day or twice a day. And therefore, say, for example, we say valgangcyclovir, valcyte, that you would have a high rate of pushing on that bone marrow. So you have a high rate of myelosuppression. And but if you do preemptive, which is then doing labs and not actually drug, you just kind of move your cost out of the pharmacy and into the lab sector. So that means once a week, you're going to do a CMV, say Q Monday, and when it hits a critical amount, then you're going to start your therapy. This requires your patient to be compliant again, but in a different way, which requires you getting labs. Some places are lab poor and it's very hard to get a patient to get labs done or it's, you know, there's just multiple issues on either side and you have to look at it from the perspective of multiple cases. So that's where papers look at this problem versus the individual in front of you and try to balance what is best for the person in front of you. Kind of turning that Rubik's Cube just a little bit, thinking about what are your actual medication options. So for primary prophylaxis, they use a lot more of the Valgang cyclovir in solid organ transplant. Why? Because their bone marrow is pristine. So you can pound a little bit on it and you won't lose your counts. Whereas in stem cell transplant, those counts are not pristine. So using Valgan for prophy just doesn't work. You would knock out the counts and then irk off all your BMT attendings. So therefore, lituvimir had become, has become the FDA approved drug for prophylaxis. In terms of treatment, you can see the list below. So that includes Merevivir, which has gotten its FDA approval for treatment. And we'll talk further in just a couple moments. How about CMB prophylaxis and SOT? So it depends on your organ how immunosuppressed the organ is, how high are you running your TAC and CSIRO, and if you're an ATG program, if you're a CAMPATH program, alemtuzumab. And that's why you can see a wide range here. For example, a heart-lung program, you could be as a mismatch. Please note, that's a mismatch. Donor positive, recipient negative, that you're getting up to definitely more than 12 months. <laughs> Whereas if you're a recipient positive, you're still a, a lot of programs where I trained, you definitely would get close to that 12 month period, especially um, even for a heart lung that's already R positive. And as you can see, there are some caveats below certain regimens. They also will add in CMV immune globulin. In all honesty, though, the last time I saw CMV immune globulin was when I was in Canada. It's very hard to get here in the U.S., 
And so at Moffitt, when we try to interpret these SOPs, we then just give them heterogeneous IVIG instead. A few words about CMV resistance, because you can't talk about treatment without talking about like what are the cons, what are the drawbacks, and drawbacks always includes resistance. So CMV needs to be phosphorylated by viral kinase encoded by UL97. And actually that tends to be the most common site for CMV resistance. It often is low level, so especially if you're an organ transplant, you can double dose or increase the dose of gang cycle or overwhelm the system. Unfortunately, that's also the site for other drugs. And I have a graphic on, I believe, the next slide in case you're a picture person. Uh, in theory, if you are UL97 resistant, you should still be sensitive to foscarnet and cytophilure. Now, if you knock out UL54, A, that's more common, and B, you have more problems statistically. This is now looking at this graphic. For example, you have Mirabavir here, your UL97, that's Gengcyclovir here is the site. Then you have Foscarnet that's coming for this mechanism. You move along here, UL56, that is your Lutivir and then you go on from there trying to stop the CMV. Let it be noted that Brinsidofavir is no longer available in the open market. So most recently at Moffitt, we went through the experience of Latuvimir and just as a couple words of humor, for the years that I was refusing to allow Latuvimir at Moffitt, initially we didn't need it because we didn't do haplos. Then as the variety or the epidemiology of our transplants changed, we definitely started to see an increased risk of CMV viremia, and then subsequently a smaller percentage of them had CMV disease, which is the more dangerous component. I literally, the last few years before okaying this drug, would be chased by the Merck team who um, has lativimir whenever I went to a conference because they were like, how are you guys not using lotivimir? And it got to be kind of humorous, uh, not so humorous. But you know, we went over it as a team. We did the discussions in the BMT standard operating protocol meetings and then brought the drug to PNT. So this was a great opportunity to discuss like what did we look at. So this was looking at clinically important amounts of CMV, looking at mortality, what were the groups of patients that they looked at, and this was all published in Francisco Marty's paper um, back in 2017. And again, it was multiple years thereafter before we met the need or had a need, and then we met it. So this is more the slide I wanted to show because Again, you can look at fancy statistics. I'm not disagreeing. They met their primary endpoint, which just to remind you guys, primary endpoint was looking at the amount of CMV at 24 weeks. Okay, so they did meet it, perfect. But my, I'm a big picture type of gal, and I look at, I'm like, well, what about CMV disease? Because viremia comes and goes, that's not that exciting CMV disease to me is, and to be technical, was not statistically significant. I mean, 1.5% versus 1.8. But then this is where I say I'm also not a BMT doctor. So, so BMT, they get a lot more excited just with viremia. They're like, oh my God, it's like a harbinger of evil to come. And I'm like, well, if our drugs work, they're like, do they really work? It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of cost. It's a lot of angst on everyone's side. So I do understand their perspective. And we're still waiting to see what is the ultimate, where does the dust settle at Moffitt specifically about how much does Latuvimir change our landscape for our patients. So that's still in process. So Whenever you have a new drug, you have to discuss it as a group, and then you have to interpret it. So our interpretation of the paper was that we would take seropositive recipients. Ideally, they should not have CMV replication at the beginning of their transplant, plus the risk factors of a core blood or a haplo 
or ex vivo T cell depletion or mismatch or ATG or alentuzumab. So the reality is usually it's the haplose or mismatch. And then we discuss like when was the optimal time to start, especially because this drug is new, it still is very cost prohibitive. And so we felt that from day plus eight to day 100 was the sweet spot to try to prevent CMV replication and therefore decrease the risk of CMV disease. Now, part of the deal was that they're supposed to send insurance information before they even come into the hospital, but oftentimes um, it's either not getting done or oddly enough, some insurances are pushing back saying you have to resubmit it on day zero which then gives the team only eight days to get their paperwork in order, which is slightly unfair, but that's the insurance's prerogative, unfortunately. Moving forward, so a couple key things with lativimir and actually also with miravivir is all about the drug-drug interactions. We have to be careful that it induces your CYP2C19, um, so voriconazole, you can see it inhibits our TAC and CIRO, so then it's a lot more drug levels. We have resistance. So whenever you bring a new drug to formulary, you always have to make sure you have the adequate lab testing to back it up. So even this happened with COVID. When we were like, we have a new infection, we have to have a PCR to test it, and you have to have your algorithm. No different here with bringing lativimir or like, how do we test for resistance? So originally it was all clinical, but thankfully Viracor has also come to help out. This was uh, left from a previous presentation, but I still wanted to bring it up that who or which scenarios are high risk for gangcyclic resistance CMV, especially in organ transplant. If you have prolonged exposure to low dose valgangcyclovir, this is often, they're always trying new kind of algorithms in the kidney transplant patients, which always kind of bothers me, but I just watch it in the background. If you are a mismatch, if you're on high level immunosuppression, and if you're a lung transplant, the reality is also uh, intestinal transplants go in that list, but you see just many, many more of the lung transplants. I really like this graphic because it helps make you think if you have CMV, viremia, and or disease, you treat them with full dose induction therapy, but for some reason the CMV PCR is going up or you don't have that logarithmic change in CMV PCR. If you have severe, and this is looking through the perspective of mainly of an organ transplant patient, but it still works for BMT, you go to full dose foscarnet. You go big, go home. If you have non-severe, you can consider going to double dosing gangcyclovir or half-half. So now the last, no, one time in the last 10 years, I believe I've done the half-half, but definitely the first time I saw it was with Dr. Green when I was a fellow, very complicated BMT patient. And the fact is it does work because it kind of is going after resistance mechanisms in two different ways. What we formerly used to call like the kamikaze maneuvers, especially in bacterial treatment. But the idea being there are algorithms on how to deal with these very difficult cases also sending off resistance panels are important. A lot of times, unfortunately, especially on BMT, we'll get back pan-sensitive um, virus, but still the CMV is not getting better. So then the question is, goes back to that one of the original slides, what is your net state of immunosuppression? What can you do to help this patient do better? Or are you stuck literally trying to go up the escalator the wrong direction and you're just never going to get better because the host is so ill to begin with. A few words about CMV resistance. So with CMV resistance, there are, depending on what lab you're utilizing, there's phenotypic and genotypic testing. At Moffitt, the choice a long time ago was to go the way of phenotypic. So it's very simple to understand. Is it sensitive? Is it resistant? Bada boom. That's pretty much it. 
Um, I believe they still have intermediate. I just haven't seen that in a long time. But the point being, it will not give you the actual gene that has the mutation. More importantly, as I kind of alluded to earlier, that with the bringing on lativiramir to formulary and then the FDA approval of Maravivir, we actually have already a contract to send the sample to Viracore and you can get all five tests done. Now, the standard is still just the first three that goes through ARUP, our normal reference lab. If you were to type CMV resistance, that's what you're going to get, gangcyclic or phoscarnate cytopavir. But say if your patient was on previously on lativiramir or maybe came from another center being on maravivir, you can literally send for that type of testing. So we just to remind everybody, we went through all of these different elements with the background. We went over workup. We went over therapies, preemptive, and medications. But before I close, I always like to go over resources. Um, this was always a key thing, even when we met for micro rounds back in the day in person, is oftentimes I think we get used to our one resource and we forget to look at all the resources that are available. There are IDSA guidelines that are free. There are the Journal of Oncology, ASCO guidelines, NCCN guidelines that are important. There are also Lexicom. Our pharmacists love Lexi. So every so often I'll go to Lexi just to be like, oh, if I can get something different. I personally am a huge proponent of the Stanford Guide. One of the things I was at a GME teaching conference a couple weeks ago, and I was like, my favorite thing is at the beginning of the rotation, be like, I'll show you what apps I use if you show me what apps you use. And consistently I utilize the Stanford Guide because they have a lot of beautiful graphics and compare and contrasting tables. And of course, the ID podcast, always an important resource. And that, you know, it truly takes a village to be smart. This is one of our older photographs, but still one of my favorite for the stewardship team. It requires our providers, our pharmacists, infection prevention, the micro lab, and our admin without one of these pieces, like it would be a house of cards, would come down. It's very important that we have everyone pulling together to do the best care possible for our patients. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you very much.